Hello and welcome to this video. And on this video, I have a special guest here. I'd like you to meet Matthew Dowie. Hello, Matthew. How are you? Hello, Andy. I'm pretty good. Thanks. Well, that's great. Um, um, and we'll be discussing the legacy of that man that we have sat in the back of your, I can see there, we got a picture there of the great Alan Holdsworth. Yeah. So, um, Matthew, I, I, I've, I've seen him putting some lovely comments up on the YouTube. I, I, I first became aware of him because I think he was watching some of the videos on there, which was yeah. great. And then I noticed he was a guitar player. So I checked out one of his videos and Matthew really is a guitar player. He absolutely blew me away and incredible playing. Um, so I started to watch what he was doing. Uh, we've sort of made contact through that, haven't we? You know, I think I put some comments about, you know, about your playing. I detected the Holdsworth influence, but what was interesting with you, Matthew, is, it, is that there's a Holdsworth in influence, but there's also not a Holdsworth influence. Yeah. And so I thought this is something that I feel is a real contentious thing with Alan Holdsworth because, of course, he hated copyists, didn't he? He hated... He did, yeah. And so and, but the thing is, it, the his playing is so powerful that it just influences guitarists and they want to play like him so um but before we get on to discussing that just tell us a little bit about you know when you started playing guitar and how you got into it and you know okay yeah you know and and also um i must say you've just done a new track um we'll talk about that and i'll show that in the video you know i might uh in fact if my editing skills are good i'm going to put it in right here so this is matthew playing the guitar <laughs> Tell us how you tell us about yourself and how you started playing guitar. Yeah, all right. So um, I'm 30 years old, and I, I think I got a guitar when I was around 11 or 12 for Christmas, just because one of my friends had one. I thought it was cool, and um, I guess around about that time I um, discovered grunge music, and I was a big Nirvana fan and Soundgarden and stuff like that, and uh, that kind of made me want to play the guitar. And some of my friends were also into that sort of thing at the time, and uh, when I got my first guitar is around about the time I started buying CDs as well down in the local HMV. And uh, one of the first albums I bought, actually the first album I bought with my own money was ACDC Back in Black. And I thought that was great, you know, because the music on that was so powerful to me as a as a teenager. Um, and uh, I kind of taught myself a lot through buying guitar magazines in the supermarket. And that opened me up to a lot of different kind of music. And then um, one big early influence for me was uh, Eric Clapton and Cream. Um, I bought a magazine that had a transcription of Crossroads in it. And I learned the, the first solo. Mm. The second one was too hard. I learned the first one. And then from that, I sort of started improvising over the blues stuff because that was vocabulary. It made mm. a lot of sense to me. And um, so after that, I, I left school when I was 16 and went to a local college where I now work as a teacher and i studied music there and um, i played in my first ever band and i thought it was amazing because you just played in a band a few days a week and wrote your own songs and learned cover songs and did gigs and stuff like that and um lucky enough the people in that band were also quite good musicians for the, the age you know mm. so around about that time we were playing iron maiden uh Black Sabbath, uh, I was big into Randy Rhodes, Michael Schenker, those kind of guys, just getting more progressively yeah. technical went on. And then uh, one of my mates got me into uh, Jason Becker, Marty Friedman, Cacophony. And I thought, well, this is like the most ridiculous stuff I'd ever heard, you know. Um, but I got into Fusion by, um, I was a big fan of uh, Megadeth. And Chris Poland on the first two albums was a fusion player and Gar Sanderson as well. Yeah. And I was reading interviews with him and he was talking about um, listening to Jan Hammer, Jeff Beck, Alan Holdsworth, um, John McLaughlin, you know, all that stuff. So I started then looking into that. So that kind of takes us up to me it's, being around. It's <laughs> partly the, with my YouTube, it, that's partly the thing that I think nobody, everybody knows this that so many, especially jazz guitarists, are coming at it through 
thrash metal, grunge, new wave of British heavy metal, you know, or like Satriani, that sort of, you're the mm. hair metal bands, but metal is the big feeding ground for so many jazz players. And yet the jazz world doesn't want to, they don't want to see this. And, and then there's a snootiness and a snottiness and, and anybody that's over on this, the metal side. Cause I, I think Alan Holdsworth is, is one of the, the, the most advanced jazz players of the last 50 years against anybody. You can put him against a Michael Brecker or Keith Jarrett. Yeah. And I feel he's as, he's as advanced if, and in some ways his concepts are even more advanced and yet, you know, because he'd got an overdriven sound, which was unlike any other metal guitarist, but because he'd got those things and there was like rock beats, he got sort of pushed aside in the whole history, you know. But uh, what was yeah. it like when you first heard Alan Holdsworth then? I got a funny story about that, because the first time I heard Alan Holdsworth was um, I bought uh, this DVD. Frank and Bally, Chop Builder. Yeah, well, that's a scary DVD as well. <laughs> there was a, a little clip of Alan Holdsworth's uh, instructional video on there yeah. of the band playing in the studio. I can't remember which tune it was, maybe Funnels or something like yeah. that. And I'd never heard anything like that before, That those kind of chords, those voicings, and his lead playing. I was used to hearing like rock licks, which is related to blues and stuff like that. And I actually just just kind of made me feel a bit queasy or something i was like i was seasick i was lost at sea i didn't really know what to grab onto but i knew there was something there that was very powerful and very profound and as time went on it was like um i kept exposing myself to his music because i knew eventually that i would get it that there was a lot there you know so yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of people who come from rock when i've spoken to them they recognize what holds was doing but not fully but they stay because it's like they're, you know, it's different to like being blown away by, say, Randy Rhodes, you know, or, or um, Paul Gilbert, you know, Martin, because you, you're impressed by the technique, but you know what they're doing. They're playing fast. Yeah. But I think with Holdsworth, there's a thing where you're dumbfounded. For me, I, when I first heard him, which was on the Soft Machine album, Land of Cocaine, mm -hmm. and I was a progger and I bought that album and, and I saw his name and I'd heard his name. And when the solo came up, I was waiting for the guitar solo to start because I just didn't think it was a guitar. I thought there's this weird, what's this? Is there a violin on here or keyboard or what is it? And then I slowly realised when the track went over, I thought, no, that was guitar. Like, that can't be guitar. Can it? Is that guitar? No, guitarists can't do that. Can it? it was just total, you know. So fast forwarding, because I want to pull these two things together. Yeah. Um, I spotted that you've you've just... Brought out a new track. We've shown a little bit, hopefully, if I've got my editing skills right. We've shown a little bit, and I'm going to put the full track at the end of this video with a link down below, everybody, for you to check it out on Bandcamp and all that sort of stuff. And um, it, I, I thought there's holes with influence, but there's all actually a, almost like um, with the, the title of it, you're actually pointing to a Holdsworth track in a way you know um and also you've got is it joel taylor on drums who, yeah, who had played in the later period so there's a there's a really strong holdsworth link there and i thought i'm going to grab one of these guys and have a chat to it so tell me how just talk about the legacy of holdsworth because the thing that's really interesting is holdsworth hate hated copyists didn't he so how, how do you you're obviously a real holdsworth fan and got the picture of the background Talk me through how you approach his influence. So um, for me, Alan Holdsworth was one of those guys that he was like the pinnacle of what could be achieved on the electric guitar. And I never had the technique, the chops, the knowledge or anything to, to play anything that he ever did. I think I've learned one Holdsworth solo, which is in the mystery, which is an extremely short solo. And I could just about play that. Yeah, well, I got it, but I, I mean, I play a bit of guitar and I thought I'm going to try and do just one of his solos and I picked in the mystery. I, I just couldn't do it. It was, like, I think, the first thing I just couldn't do. That... Very, very, very difficult. And, you know, Alan Holdsworth as well, massive guy, giant hands, yeah. you know, everyone knows that about him. And um, for me, it's, it was too difficult for me to learn. You know, if I did spend enough time, I'm sure I could learn more of his stuff. But for me, I've, I've, I've been listening to, his, listening to his music for the past, maybe, say, 13 years or so. I discovered him when I was around 17, 18, when I was still mostly listening to a lot of rock and kind of like shred guys. But I think that 
his language, his whole approach that was so unique. It's more that the influence is um, maybe people can tell it's there, but it's hopefully not so obvious or so overt. And I'm not trying to rip him off. I'm not trying. No, to... I, I, that's why. I, that's why I, I thought this guy is doing it in a really interesting way. And it's interesting that you'd say it's almost because I think the the best copying is when you're not really competent to pull it off. So you find your own way. But I've got to say, Matthew, if you're check this guy's playing out I, I your chops is are incredible and your your ability to play inside core progressions i just it just blew me away you've really got some stuff going on so and and, and so i you know i know you you're saying this but it, it, I, i'm the same with certain drummers you know you it, like say vinny colliuto is a massive influence on me i couldn't do the actual licks that he does but the spirit of his drumming you know, I really believe that City Nights has got possibly the best guitaring and the best drumming. Yeah. And it's I, when I saw Vinny, it was like, I don't know what he's doing. And I wanted to play in a way where people go, I don't really know what that guy's doing. I wasn't interested in copying his licks, but just trying to emulate this much more left field choices. I think that's part of the thing with Holdsworth, the choices. So that's yeah. really interesting. I think... Um... Holdsworth, you know, that he took the time to sort of just find his own way with things. And um, it's very, very hard to recognize uh, licks or patterns. I know that you talked to um, John Vullo yeah. about his massive video and he transcribed so much Holdsworth and found patterns in there and things like that. But it's something that it's not really very obvious. And if he does have patterns, he's maybe combining them in really um, unusual and interesting ways all the time. And then, um, yeah, I guess that for me, because I've listened to so much of his music, I, bu I bought the box set of it, uh, all his albums that came out, you know, remastered, but I had most yeah. of them before that came out. I went right back to the Bottom stuff. Yeah. And Soft Machine, you know, the stuff with UK, Bruford. I've listened to like almost everything that he's done because I love it. I love his sound, his approach. I actually think as well that Alan Holdsworth is one of the best and most distinctive composers without a doubt uh, this is the the, the trouble with holds with is the, the the physical playing aspect is so incredible especially how early on he's like he's like 20 years ahead of every guitarist but people forget his guitar tone is equally advanced his compositional approach is equally advanced yeah. his improvisational concepts which are actually quite strange because there's a lot of free jazz to me in there. There's, 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 he can play incredibly diatonically, and he'll also play things that are almost just shapes. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, I I'm as, as a guitarist, I know I'm very influenced by Holdsworth, but the thing with me is, I, I, I'm a picker and I never got that legato thing going. And, um, so when if you don't play the his lines if you try and pick his lines they just don't work at all mm -hmm. and so how, so can you t what's your technique like because I, I noticed you you've got a little bit more bite and grit and i was thinking yeah. you playing i think you play legato don't you but it's kind of a, a mixture i would say um so the the pure legato thing i found very difficult because um my hands aren't that large you know and it's just difficult for me if I'm trying to do big stretches and stuff like that. But obviously John McLaughlin is a big influence and in that of picking things. So I tried to mix those two things together um, in a way. And um, another guy that I really love, which is who's almost like a combination of elements from McLaughlin Holdsworth is uh, Steve Topping as well. I and don't I really, know him. I don't think I don't know him. Oh, him. Steve Topping. He, you must check him out, Andy. I think you really love him. He um he played a lot with Gary Husband, sort of in the early days, you know, the seventies, early eighties. He was oh, really back. He goes back that far. Yeah, he oh, did. Some you, stuff. This is why I love this channel. Go on, just yeah. tell me about this guy. So Steve Topping, he did some stuff in Level Forty Two. I think maybe whenever Holdsworth sort of left, you mm -hmm. know, around the guaranteed era. Um, he's got two brilliant solo albums, which have the first one uh, is a trio with Gary Husband and. Paul Carmichael of the, the IOU mm. trio. And then his other album, uh, there's a lot more orchestration going on. He's got some cello and viola, some strings on it. He's got Jimmy Johnson on that one. 
incredible. And he's also got a big a bit of the John McLaughlin Shakti acoustic influence as well. I think so, I did check him out once a few years back. I think it is his ringing a bell. And I, I, yeah, I think I know the guy, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I uh, you know, in the comments, because you know the people who watch this channel, they like know way more than I do. You know, we're going to have everything about Steve Topping now, you know. Um, yeah. there's, there's a British guitarist. Do you know? Do you know Mike Walker? I no, no I don't actually. Yeah, no. I'm going to throw that back at you. There's a British guitarist called Mike Walker, and he is astonishing. And I've seen him live many a time. Um, and I'll, there's a there's a great album that I wanted to talk about on my channel that you can get on Bandcamp. And he's an incredible composer. He does all sorts of stuff, but he can he doesn't do it all the time. But he can go into an area. That's somewhere between John Schofield and Holdsworth. Right. Yeah, it's, it, like it's in it really and I and I I enjoy that far more than people just copying Holdsworth. You know, it's always really impressive when someone says I've nailed this solo and they put it online, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah, that that's 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 really interesting. I'll well, I'll, I'll check him out. Yeah. Believe me, I would love to be able to play Alan Holtra's solos. I have a transcription of his solo on Questions of the Warden Cliff Tower album, but mm. it's just, it's so difficult. And the amount of time that I would have to put into it to learn it perfectly, it sort of has taken time away from me working on my own concepts and my own ideas that I kind of feel like, well, Alan's already did that. It's on the recording. Why do I need to learn it? Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm totally with you on this. And I, 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 I've I was never a big transcriber of like drum solos. What I would do is I'd take a couple of bars, and there's there's bars by certain drummers that have totally changed my concept of music, you know. Yeah. And I and it's the same thing with Holdsworth. There's, there's a couple of licks that there's a couple of things I've taken directly from Holdsworth as a guitarist. One of them is 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 like that messian mode, you know, the way he, it it's it's like he does like semitone semitone and tone, but he breaks it up. He's, and I, I, I do that a little bit, you know, some of the symmetrical stuff I've got from him, you know, but uh, um, I think you're right. I think once you get into transcribing solos, it can be a double edged sword, can't it? Because you're going to play those licks, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And the, the interesting thing is because I also play a lot of um, Django Reinhardt music, I've transcribed way more Django, some Charlie Christian, some Borelli Legrand, because that music is much more, um, there's a lot of things that people expect you to play you know like uh in a way i like that uh, as a challenge to try and place improvise stylistically in that sort of area but when i try to do my own music it's more i try to leave um be as open as possible with that but i think the thing that you touched on there was talking about messian modes that i think is very interesting is i can hear a big um classical music uh element to alan holdsworth's um compositions maybe he was possibly familiar with Messi and I'm not sure I've never heard him speak about Messi but I know that he was a fan of Ravel, Debussy, uh, Elgar, maybe Stravinsky as well that I can hear a lot of and that kind of relates to I got really into classical music and I actually just last month finished my master's degree in music composition at um, the university here in Belfast mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that stuff as well has influenced my own music and it might be some of the same lineage that Holdsworth is coming from in terms of maybe 20th century music as well. Yeah, I, 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 I what you're saying is, is that, which is really interesting, and I haven't thought of it so much because I write, and there's a whole massive influence of Holdsworth in what I write harmonically. Uh, and, and I think that there's influence, and then there's influence, and there's a whole school of people who go, I don't really like Holzer's solo albums. I like him much more when he's with, you know, he's, he's sessioning. And I'm going, yeah, that's because you have to go deep into Holzer's compositions. Yeah. You have to go really deep. That, that's really interesting. So you're talking about your own music. So, um, you know, I, I saw that you've done this new track. So tell us a little bit about the new track, how it came about, who's playing on it, what the inspiration is for it. Okay. Um, so this new track is called Clark Key Nights and like you said it's sort of a little nod to City Nights the whole truth track because um, I recently had the chance to visit Singapore for a couple of weeks towards the end of last year and that it just had quite a profound uh, effect on me visiting that place and such a vibrant 
crazy busy city mm. and all the big buildings they're all lit up at night and i had some great experiences there and i kind of influenced this track and i wanted to capture the energy of spending new year's eve in clark key the area mm. of singapore has the most bars and restaurants and stuff and um yeah so i i wrote the tune earlier on this year probably back in february and i knew i wanted to do a proper recording in a real studio because everything that you might have heard before that i sent you mm. on my soundcloud was just done mostly at home because of you know mm. that was something to keep me occupied during covid lockdown really but um so i decided i wanted to do a real professional track i wanted to get some great players on it do it in a great studio with a great producer so i've got um joel taylor on drums and i just reached out to joel uh over facebook and sent him some of my you know home recordings mm. and said I, I love your work. I love your playing with Alan and Frank and Bally and everything. And here's what I do. Would you like to play on one of my tracks? And he said, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. So um, I recorded all the parts at home, just kind of a uh, demo version sent it to him. I didn't tell him anything. I didn't say I wanted to play this or that. I just mm. said, do whatever you want. And he sent me back a take that he was happy with. And I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing because where I am in Belfast and um, this type of music, it, it's not really very popular. I don't really know anyone else, especially guitar players, even that really play it or are into it. It's very hard to find drummers that, you know, they have a big appreciation for this style. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was so happy that Joel decided to do it because I knew that he would really elevate the whole thing, you know, mm. and then um, on bass, fretless bass, I have my friend, Phil Smith, who is a, uh, incredible musician he also plays um the oud uh he is a great improviser he's done a lot of work with a local composer called brian irvine and he was in a band that was all free improv for years you know big big band free improv big band mm. and he's done a lot of turn around and he told me once he uh he met um the band oregon when he was doing a gig in italy and he got the chat with ralph towner and he said that was great you know seeing those guys and so he's on fretless bass and then a fantastic uh, local pianist keyboard player called Scott Flanagan and um, played some Fender Rhodes and some synth pads and the synth lead doubling the melody and stuff. And he is, um, he plays more in a kind of mainstream traditional, like modern jazz context, although he, he can play everything, you know, um, occasionally I play with him in an organ trio doing the kind of like Grant Green sort of stuff. I mean, we actually did, um, the John McLaughlin tune, Little Miss Valley, at a, a few gigs recently, which is cool. And um, so he's on keys on it, and I'm just so happy that I have such. No, great music. And you're, and I love the way you're exploring all these different styles. It sounds like that's a real big thing for you is is mm -hmm. is exploring all these different players. That's that's really interesting. Did um did Joel pass on any Hendrix um oh, Hendrix Holdsworth stories? Did you uh? uh not really because i never really got to have a yeah. proper like conversation with him maybe it's something we could do in the future if i get yeah. him to play more tracks it was mostly just messaging and sending emails back and forth but um i was watching some interviews with him and he's got some cool stories about uh i think he introduced um holdsworth to uh dave carpenter and kind of got that trio well, going yeah that up on 16 men of teen but i think what happened there was he got an offer of a very high paying gig somewhere else. So Alan ended up using um, Gary Novak on the, on the CD. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, Joel, he was great to work with, you know, he made it super easy. He was very well, nice. Just, these are the top end players. I mean, if you played yeah. Alan Holdsworth, it's, it's, a you know, um, I, I, I met Alan Holdsworth in, I think 94. He came and played. I, I I saw Holdsworth. I think twice. I feel like it was three times, but I definitely it was twice. And uh, the first time was in London, and then the second time it was in a club in Birmingham. You know, and I, that's about half an hour away from me. And then um, at the half time, he came out. He went to the bar to get a drink, and I was with a um, he was with I was with one of my students, and he was a huge Holdsworth fan. And I said, look, you should go and talk to him. Well, I really wanted to talk to him. And so we went up and said hi, and he did chat to us. And he, of course, it was the usual, oh, I'm sorry I put you through that. You know, I, I apologise for my playing and, you know, and all that type of stuff. But he was also really funny and and sort of amenable as well. He, he, he was quite happy to sit and chat and have a joke with us and, you know, 
Uh, but the thing I remember about that gig that everybody I knew was at the gig. <laughs> Every guitarist was at the gig and another guitarist, they did this improvisation at the end where he just came out and it was just totally free and he went out for about 20 minutes. And when it was over, we went to go and my mate, who well, I was with, he just, well, where's he? Where's he? Couldn't find him. And we went over and he was still stood in the spot staring at the stage wow. like that. And we had to sort of push him literally. And he went, oh God, like that. And he said, oh my God. He said, that was amazing, wasn't it? And he goes, and he was just in the deep thought about what he'd just gone through. It was unbelievable. And then Holdsworth was like, oh, I'm sorry to put you through this type of yeah. thing. I've I've heard a lot of stories about him, and you know, I've, I, I, there's a guy on the the Alan Holdsworth Facebook page called Chip Flynn who puts up a lot of stories about um how Alan was as a person, and he he seemed like a real just a real lovely guy, really like quite a sensitive kind of guy. And unfortunately, I never got the chance to hear him live. I think I'm just a little too young, or maybe yeah. he didn't really make it over to the UK in the past kind of safe maybe ten or fifteen years, and when I would have been able to to go to a concert but you know at least we have all his recordings the concert yeah I, I i saw him that i think that was possibly it it, it could have been a hard hat area when i saw him the yeah. second time the first time i saw him was on the secrets tour wow. in 89 and wow. and so that and he was just it was just at his peak absolutely, absolutely is his peak you know um I've 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 studied him quite a lot and um I've picked up that he's a number of times he said if he heard someone playing one of his licks, he never played that lick again. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is quite a feat in itself because how do you not play a lick? It's like we all have our licks. And yeah. I think that shows um a real it, 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 I, I don't think he was operating like normal musicians. I think um, the, he's, he's operating on another level. I, I, I work with a guitarist called Roy Marchbank, who I met through the channel. And, and Roy's a bit like this. He's, he's, he's pushing the guitar so hard that he's, he, he, it's like, he, it almost pains him to do anything predictable. Yeah. You know, and I've heard um, a little bit of Roy's work and I saw the video you put up of the, the gig you played together yeah. and he's just, I don't know what that guy's doing. It's just like <laughs> I, I know. haven't seen or heard anything like that. You know, it, it does sort of remind me in some ways of a, a Sean Lane type of thing, you know, um, yeah. just the, the sheer speed. But maybe if I were to slow it down and analyze what he's doing, I would get a better picture of sort of where he's coming from. But yeah. I haven't seen anybody play a guitar like that. It's like... If, and the thing is, is, his concepts harmonically are coming out of almost like Coltrane. Holdsworth as well, but it's more Coltrane as well. It, 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 a lot of the phrasing is so incredible. You know, um, it, we, we're working on a project together at the moment, um, which I don't want to say too much about, but the thing is, is that it, it's involving a lot of synthesis yeah. so that he can really pull out sort of the saxophone sounds and I think he's really nailed this and it's because uh, I think the thing with Roy is he actually gets a lot of negativity it's like there's a there's a lot of gatekeepers there's the Holdsworth gatekeepers there's the Sean Lane gate and it, and and they they, they seem to just want to put him down because they can't accept that this guy's doing something as equal and um I think because of the the incredible technical way he plays when you hear that executed, say with a, a violin sound or a trump, a, a saxophone sound, those prejudices that people have, they have. There's like almost like a prejudice to the guitar when you play it fast. No, no yeah. one would have a go at saxophone player for playing fast. But as soon yeah. as you play fast on a guitar, people are like, "Oh, there's just there's no emotion and all you know and all that." And I, to me, holds with the most emotional guitar player that I can think of. I would agree. I would agree when he. Uh... Some of those live recordings, like that one, uh, then yeah, oh god, yeah, absolutely just playing the most crazy fast, and he's up really high, and and just it just pours out of him, you know. It's all it is almost like a Coltrane kind of thing. Obviously, his vocabulary is very different, but it's that the energy level of it is there's a very, very small 
percentage of guitarists i think that can approach that you know me um roy from what i've seen is doing stuff like that uh gambali as well and he's really ripping and going for it it's just just cascades of notes all over the place you know and that's super exciting to hear and that's something that it seems to me that the level of technique that is required on guitar to do that it's like it's the elite of the elite but it's almost like that level of playing is sort of just taken for granted on the saxophone and piano because you know with Coltrane and stuff maybe the the the, the bar was set high a lot earlier than on the guitar if that makes sense oh, I, I think the guitar has got inbuilt problems that other instruments haven't got because i play a little bit of keyboards mm. and and i could say i can go up and go what so what would a you know a, a g7 sharp 5 be and pretty quickly i found it even though i don't play the keyboards on a guitar i'll be there it's a, it's work mm -hmm. and then you go so what's the scale that goes with this well you look at the chord you play you fill out a few notes you've got the scale and then the facility you it's 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 one i mean there's facility required but it's it's not two hands trying to ex i haven't got to use my other hand to make the notes come out then on top of it you've got the tuning discrepancy on the guitar which just makes it turns it into a lifetime's work and i think we've all got to a point where we've gone oh i just wished i'd kept it in fourths because my de my desire to play bar chords now <laughs> is is I I've, I I think that the guitar is so hard work to get to anything that for another musician would be so much easier. And if you listen to the people that are playing at those insane speeds when they're improvising, um, they're not playing bebop vocabulary generally. They're playing guitar specific vocabulary, you know, and they've worked it out themselves. So Gambali's got the whole sweeping thing. Mm. McLaughlin, he's playing a lot of patterns that maybe they come from Coltrane originally, but it's that kind of, you know, the one, two, three, five kind of pattern. He brings yeah, yeah, up. yeah, yeah. That's because it's an even number of notes. Yeah. The, you know, alternate picket. And then Holdsworth, he solved the problem of synchronization by picking a lot less notes and doing a lot more with the left hand. So it's almost like whatever technical solution you come to will totally influence the vocabulary that you're going to play on the guitar. And that's something that because there are so many options, it's not standardized. Yeah. I think that's why it's so rare. And I think also the four note per string where so he, he can cover sort of a and just on two strings almost like a do do a whole octave. Yeah. You know, and yeah. all that that all that and I, I I just couldn't do that. I just found that so hard to do. Yeah. But I think that it's these these approaches are the legacy of Holdsworth. I think there's a number of things technically that he pioneered which i think is i think i don't think he's legato's like anybody else because you know you mentioned michael schenker i loved michael schenker and that's how i call that hammer-ons and pull-offs yeah. but holdsworth doesn't seem to do hammer-ons and pull-offs he just seems to if play almost like a piano you know <laughs> it's, 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 it's almost like if you imagine on the piano when you traverse the keyboard this way you're kind of hitting notes on the way and yeah. it's almost like that's what holdsworth is doing on the fretboard when he expands his hand out like this it's almost like any combination of those four fingers he can execute rapidly at yeah. will you know it's just really i don't think there's hardly anyone that has actually mastered that and been able to improvise in that way you know, well, and that, that's like he's kind of laid all this stuff down and that people are going to be maybe in 100 years, that will be just standard operating procedure for a guitarist. They'll be able yeah, to do maybe. that. Maybe. I, I, I think he, he's he, there's a way he, he's I think he felt music very deeply from what I've heard. I think he's trying to express something emotionally. And that's what very few people understand. And I think there's an incredible emotional, intense which Coltrane has as well, you know, uh, and you know, quite a few jazz players have it. But I think he's not playing fast to impress; he's playing it to express something. Yeah, you know, and it's um, almost a, um, possibly a, a, almost a spiritual dimension. You know, you have that whole element with Coltrane and going through to John McLaughlin, Mahavishnu. Without, and, yeah. Well, we've we, we've got five minutes of this session left, yeah. you know, so we'll 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 have to pull it together there. So. Um, I'm going to put a link in below to Matthew's track. And what was it called again? It's 
Clark Key Knight. Clark Key Knight. So, and I know, you know, all you watch this channel, you know what you like. We all know what we like. And I don't bring anything in here if I not don't think the viewers to this channel are not going to enjoy it. So if you could click on the links below, you know, and um, at the end of this video, I will put up the whole track to watch anyway. So if you just wait around for a few minutes, you'll be able to, you know, watch Matthew doing his thing. Absolutely. Great. I'm really impressed, Matthew. Are you going to do more? Are we going to get an album? Um, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, again, it's uh, it's expensive to make recordings, but I'm going to try and do maybe an, a few more standalone tracks and then eventually a full album if I can, if I can get some kind of funding. Oh, brilliant. Well, as soon as you've got that, let us know and we will put it on the channel. So it's it's been great talking to you. I'm going to switch it off now. And um, for the views watching, do you want to introduce your track? Clark Key Nights. <laughs>